So how'd you get started in your karate training? <laughs> I wanted to hit people. <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> Hitting. Does this bring you joy? Yes. This brings me lots of joy. <laughs> if you had to give up one thing, hitting people or painting, which one would you give Ooh, up? Ooh, that's not a good mm. question. Okay, <laughs> let me make it a little easier. If I had to give up one thing, hitting people, painting, or gardening, what would you give up? Uh, probably the gardening. Okay, but you can't give up the karate and the painting? No, uh, no. I mean, what is <laughs> karate but painting with your fist? <laughs> All right, thanks, Judy. <laughs> Welcome to our podcast. Today we have a special treat as I sit down and talk with Weichiru Karate pioneer, Judy Durkin. Sensei Durkin began her karate training in 1971 under George Matson and is a ninth degree black belt. In 1974, she founded Buzz Durkin's Weichi Karate School with her husband, Buzz Durkin. This fall, she's testing for her 10th degree black belt and grandmaster title. During our interview, we sit down and talk about the early days of her training and how her steadfast training methodology has helped her keep up with her practice after 50 plus years. We also dive into how her karate has helped her stay calm under pressure and while dealing with difficult people. Anyone who has ever trained with Mrs. Durkin knows that there are few things that she enjoys more than heavy conditioning while having a joyful conversation. I learned a lot from our thoughtful, enlightening conversation, and I hope you do too. Please enjoy Sensei and soon-to-be Grandmaster, Judy Durkin. So let's get started. Thank you for coming on today and chatting with us. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for asking me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Maybe for those who don't know you, um, we can just kind of start like how you started your martial arts journey, how you started training in karate. Um, very interesting, but not that exciting. <laughs> so my brother Arthur, who was younger than me, started, um, he had a few health issues and my parents wanted him to be able to defend himself. We grew up in the Cambridge, Boston area. So they took him to various different karate schools in Cambridge and Boston and settled on Sensei George Matson's school on Hancock Street in Boston. And I'm still amazed to this day that these two people, my parents, knowing nothing about the martial arts or anything, ended up at Sensei Matson's. So that's where my brother started and he would come home and show me Yep, the circular block, how to punch and everything. And I thought, well, this looks interesting. So I went in and took a class and I had no idea what I was doing, obviously, but for some reason I really loved it. And um, just meeting up with Sensei George and who is such an amazing man, even to this day, and this was back in 1971. And that's where I met Buzz, of course, and that is, the start of our history. But um, yeah, so sometimes I think back how incredible, it, it's so weird how our, what paths our life turns to, how my parents found that school. I met Sensei George, I met Buzz, and Buzz and I ended up getting married, as you know. But when I think back, it amazes me that all the friends I've made, the school that we built, um, and none of that would have happened if my parents hadn't brought my brother to that school. Yeah. We wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't be sitting here. So kind of <laughs> I wouldn't course, even know you. <laughs> set the course of your life in that in, in place. I know. Place. Yeah. So it's, what was it that kind of drew you to training in karate? Like what about it like really what part of it did you see that you're like, I really want to do that? I know you'll agree with me. It was. I know what it's going to be. What do you be. think you're going to? You're going to say you just, you just like hitting people. I did. <laughs> I did, Bill. I swear to God. And so I ended up doing like my first class, sparring, um, arm conditioning. Mm -hmm. And I, it was so weird. It was so foreign to me. But. But I liked it because of that reason, because it was different. None of my friends were doing it. Um, and then after the, you know, the arm conditioning, the rubbing to get the circulation going and everything, and then they showed us the arm pounding, the conditioning. And that was it. I'm like, okay. I can do this. This is fun. <laughs> I like hitting stuff. I like hitting people. So as you 
as you learn more about the martial arts and about Waitra Karate, what kind of kept you going besides the hitting people? Like what, what kind of kept you interested in the training? <clears throat> I have to say that it was buzz. Okay. Because, um, we, you know, we started seeing each other, whatever you want to call it back then, um, and planning on building a school together. I think I would have stuck with it anyway because I really enjoyed it. But it would have been different? It would have been different. Mm. But it was because of Buzz that I kept going and kept going to class. Arthur and I always went to his Friday night class, which was always huge. Um, yeah, I think it, it, because of that, it just became part of my life. How did it? And it still is. How did it, how did it affect, how did it affect uh, everything else you did in life? So you spent many years, if I'm correct, as a ER or a surgery nurse. Mm. How did that, yeah. how did the karate help you outside the dojo? <clears throat> Surgical nurse. Um, yep, I worked in the OR for almost 50 years. And it helped me, as the time goes on now when I think about it, I, and I realize all the ways that it helped me. It helped my stamina, for one thing. I mean, I could be awake literally. Literally, we were awake and working 24 hours Yikes. in a row. They don't do that so much anymore. Mm -hmm. But I'm going back to 1975 and it's onward. A little different. <laughs> a little different now. But um, it, my, it helped my stamina. And it, it's just like in class. You know, if you're doing your cut or and you start out strong, if you're getting tired towards the end, you still are do, doing your movements fast and strong. So you want to finish as strongly as you started. Um, so the same thing in, in the operating room. I could, if, if I felt like I was getting tired, I just kept pushing and pushing. So physically, it helped in that way. Um, mentally, it just kept me calm and focused. Mm -hmm. Even being called at 2 a.m. for brain surgery at Leahy Clinic, all the way in, I'm just planning, you know, what to set up when I get there, what to do. And I know that karate has helped with, help, definitely helped with all of that. Yeah, I mean, just having so, the determination to keep your body and mind awake and focused in that setting, I mean, that's something that definitely comes yeah, with the training. With, without getting all worked up and excited, I, I was just always maintained an even keel. Zen? Zen. <laughs> and uh, actually, I was going to come to that at some point because that's what I get out of it now. It, it's a whole Zen quality. I'm more, um, I guess it's the whole concept of yin and yang, right. the balance between harmony and peace, but also being strong and hard in your workouts. And, and I'm finding that I'm leaning more now towards the peaceful part of it. <laughs> Dare I say, Judy Durkin, the peaceful side of it. <laughs> it's it's kind of like an act of meditation. <clears throat> Definitely. Yep. Are you yep. able to, like, be still and meditate in whatever form that might be? Or do you feel like you need to be mobile to clear your head? No. I'm always still. Okay. I can, I can be very still okay. in my head, in my head and my body. Just the whole picture. Yeah, it, I mean, for so many years, it was everything was physical, right? With me, anyway, and I was never really analytical about my practice. Um, you know, well, this can also, you know, this block can also be a strike, and um, I never really tried to analyze anything. I just went in every day from the very beginning and did everything. I listened. I did everything hard, and as fa as hard and as fast as I could. And I still do that, mm -hmm. but I really, really appreciate the whole Zen part of it now. And don't you know? Nobody can explain that, so I'm not even going to try. But it's different for every person, too. Yeah, and I think it helps. Um, it really helps me. It helped me over the years to be where I'm at. When, when you're in the dojo working out, you really your mind can't be anyplace else. It has to be. Here. You can't be in the middle of 
a bonkai with four different people attacking and be thinking, oh, I shouldn't have done that yesterday. Or, you know, worried about something the next day. You can't do that. You're always here. We're always here. Unless you want to get punched in the face. Unless you want to get punched in the face. <laughs> So, so, it, so that helps outside the dojo as well. So no matter what I do now, um, if I'm listening to music and painting, that's what I'm doing. I'm not, except if I stop to pat the cats or something. Right. But I'm not planning on what I'm doing the next day. Or So it, every, it helps keep me in the moment. That's something too. that we can all learn a lot from, I think. It's so easy nowadays to be distracted. I catch myself instead of focusing on like easy. the work I'm doing, like, oh, I just got a text message, I better look at that. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. I'll change it to a different playlist on my, <laughs> on my music. Just being in the moment, I think, is so critical. Something that we can all really take advantage of and just mm -hmm. live, I don't want to say easier lives, but definitely more fulfilling lives. Just to yeah, yeah, I agree. Take a breath and just do what you're doing. Yeah. So you talked about painting a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, you're, you're an artist, you're a very, very well accomplished painter, in my opinion. I know Thank you're going to you. say, I know you're going to say, no, 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 <laughs> you're very humble, but I, I've been watching. Have you been painting your whole life, or is that just something within the past 20 years you picked up? Um, I am going to say in the past 20 years. I painted in grammar school and high school, okay. but then going to nursing school and working and getting married, helping with the dojo and everything, it kind of went by the wayside. So I was very happy to pick it up yeah. again later in life. Well, it's, it's been cool for me because I get to be on the sidelines watching your progression over the past <laughs> 20 years and watching, the, starting off with what I would say a lot of skill and then getting even better and better as you go. Mm. Uh, do you find a correlation between the painting and the martial arts? Um. I do, actually. And you know, I never thought about it until you just asked yes. me that question. But I think in the, so in the martial arts, it, and this is not the way I was taught, but it's the way I always was. It, Sensei George Matson, like the man and Buzz, always kept telling us to stay loose, don't be so rigid, don't be so focused, don't be so tense. Um, but it took me years. And I'm still working my way out of that. But obviously, the looser you are when you throw your punch, and they always described it as an arrow leaving the bow, just like really fast, really fast and loose. Um, fast and loose is stronger and faster. So you're definitely stronger, but it took me a long time to realize that. And that's what I'm trying to do with my painting now. Really? Yeah. So instead of like trying to focus on every little detail, and that, I mean, you should focus on details in the martial arts. It's the detailed technique that makes you good. But, um, but just try to stay more loose in my painting. More bolder strokes, mm -hmm. looser, faster. Mm -hmm. I actually just started a book, How to Paint Bolder, Looser, and Faster. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's just like my karate. <laughs> it's going to be bolder, looser, and faster. Maybe we can read that book to get some karate tips. <laughs> Do you find that I, I, I myself with my training can be very analytical about it and get caught up in the details versus just doing it? Do you find with painting that's kind of what you're working on right now where instead of like every little micro stroke, yeah. you just like just yeah. do it and whatever happens, happens and you move on? Right, right. Not happy mistakes, mm. as Bob Ross used to say. Happy little <laughs> um, trees. Yeah, the happy little trees. I, I, so I think in the martial arts, you do have to pay attention to detail, especially when you're first starting. Listen, pay attention to the technique, do the technique properly. So when you do, if you, we ever do have to use it on the street, you don't have to think about it. It's there, and you can afford to be looser and bolder mm -hmm. and stronger. But um, yeah, so the same with painting. I find myself with an empty canvas and, oh, this is gonna be great. I'm just gonna splash color on it and do lots of different brush strokes and try different things. And it's, then eventually, sometimes I end up like painting every little detail like you said. <laughs> so I'm trying to get away from that. Just have fun with it. Have fun with it, exactly. 
Which is what we should be with our martial arts, too. Exactly. And that's what keeps me coming to class all the time. And it, that's, that's impressive. You've been doing this for over 50 years now, mm -hmm. training the martial arts, and you, every class is still fun for you. It, I, it's cra I know. It's crazy, Bill. I have, I, have the best, I have the best workouts, the best time, um, and everybody does. And then when we leave, and I know I'm not the only one, you know, the endorphins and the high you get after a run or a good workout, you you feel good for the rest of the day or two days. It really carries over. Absolutely. And you get to surround yourself with people who are doing a like-minded thing. Like all there, minded people. All there for the same reason, to improve themselves. Maybe they're trying to improve different parts of themselves or they're there for slightly different um, end goals of their training, but they're all yeah. there to get better. I think yeah. that's really yeah. important for people to surround themselves with positive people. Right. And everybody is positive and they just, they're really fun and they help, everybody helps each other. So you're there to get better yourself and also to help others get better. So with, with all these years of training, uh, all these fun experiences on the dojo floor, uh, you've, you've taken lots of trips to uh, mm -hmm. Okinawa. Did you also go to China with Mr. D? No. Okay. No. But you've been to Okinawa a couple times? Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, so many things you've done stateside and working with so many different people. Do you have any like favorite karate memories you'd like to share? Um, definitely, my favorite is meeting uh, Master Kanye Weiji. Okay. When on my first trip to Okinawa, I went with a girlfriend. Uh, we didn't arrive on the island of Okinawa until 10 p.m. at night. We were picked up by Master Takamiyagi, who brought us, and I didn't think I would see Master Weiji till the next day brought us straight to his dojo when he was there waiting for us. 10 p.m. at night. Oh, it was, um, it was overwhelming to actually be studying all those years and to meet the, the Mr. Weiji. Right. So that was totally overwhelming. And then we all became such good friends between us going over there a few more times and um, Master Weiji and his wife and Kanmei, Master Kanye, Kanmei Weiji, his son. Mm -hmm. um, we just became so friendly with mm -hmm. them. And when I think back, I feel like I took it all for granted. But I know I appreciated it at the time. Right. But just the different, just actually meeting them, and I became really good friends with Shigi, um, Master Kanye Weiji's wife. And we never went anywhere, all the sightseeing trips when they came here, when we went to Okinawa, that she and I were not arm in arm, like nice. walking up mountains and everything. She's the one that did the, the print behind us, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. For those who are listening to the audio yeah. version of this, in Mr. Durkin's dojo at the front, there's uh, some kanji that says sacred space. I don't know what the trend, what it actually is in Japanese, but it's a, it was from a wood carving that Shiggy did a ink rubbing on? I, I, yes, I believe so. We've, we've had it for a long time, but it, it's a sacred space between a teacher and a student. And you felt like you had yeah. that when you were over there as well? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think one of my favorite memories, we had a cookout in our backyard, and um, Mr. Weiji was there and his son and several of the other Okinawans and a lot of our friends. And Buzz and I came into the house for something, more drinks or whatever, and Mr. Weiji was sound asleep. I know people have heard this story. He was sound asleep in Buzz's Lazy Boy recliner. <laughs> and he had, he had his head back. He knew just how to lift the feet up, the mm -hmm. foot up and everything. And Buzz and I are like, oh my God, oh my God, Mr. Weiji's asleep it's so, in my recliner. <laughs> it's so funny to, 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 to realize that these people you put on such a high pedestal. I know. Like, oh, they're just people too. Yeah, yeah. And we kept looking at each other like, should we get the camera? <laughs> but we didn't. We, of course we couldn't. But it was, it was something that we'll, ne <laughs> we'll never forget. <laughs> oh, man. And, and then um, his son, Kanmei, Master Kanmei Weiji, and his wife visited my parents Did in they? Cambridge. And I was taking them sightseeing in Boston. We stopped by my parents' house. So I have pictures of Mr. Weiji's son in my parents' kitchen 
in Cambridge. So that was that's pretty special too. That's really cool. They all had huge smiles on their face. And you had one too. I all yep. <laughs> that's really cool. So you you guys have hosted Okinawans many a times, and you've obviously had Mr. Matson up a ton mm. since he's moved to Florida. Yeah. What's what's yeah. what's your favorite memory on like? Did you ever have any moment in your training, any epiphany or anything, or any memory that really like stood out just training on the dojo floor, whether it was here in Atkinson in Salem at the Matson Academy or overseas? Anything that like really clicked in your mind like and affected your training long term? Does that question make no, sense? No, it, it's a oh it may, yeah, it, it definitely Sorry, makes that's, sense. That's, I'm just not I'm not sure I have an answer. My training was just Steady? On an even keel, steady, just over the years. Um, no, I just loved what I was doing. And I, and I think the way I evolved was I, I just listened, listened, worked hard, and hit hard. No, I'm serious. Sometimes and that's <laughs> the secret to training is you don't have to have an epiphany to, to be successful. You just, like you said, be steadfast in it. Yeah, so that, that's what I was doing. And then as I progressed, I did the same thing, only harder. So it was a different level, a different degree. Mm -hmm. I don't remember anything really standing out. I'm a, I'm a little excited now discovering how to stay loose and keeping everything loose and right. how much more powerful and fast. How have you had to adjust your training over the years? I mean, obviously you still train, you still train hard, you still hit hard, you still train regularly, but obviously, I mean, I know I have shoulder injuries that pop up every now and then. How have you had to deal with stuff that's come up for you as you've progressed? I've been so lucky. I really have. I mean, you know I have had a shoulder problem right. which has been taken care of. But other than that, um, yeah, for a couple of years before that, I had to modify things I did with this. Um, but I've been really, really lucky. I, you know, my kicks, my everything else, my punches. Um, did I hear yeah, a story? I, Sorry for interrupting you. Did oh I hear a story? <laughs> I don't know. I'll say no. Did I hear a story of you <laughs> in the OR room kicking a fly out of the air? Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Excuse me, a fly in the OR. That sounds terrible. But they get in. Yeah. They get in, and you just got to get rid of them, and I did. <laughs> and everyone went, oh, like in the Karate Kid. <laughs> I know. I know. Yes, that was the true story. Oh, man. And I think when, um, as a nurse working, when I first you know, in the first, in my early years in studying the martial arts, I, I think it really helps to work out at home. And I used to, and I know a lot of people do this because they've told me, but it, in the nurse's lounge, if there was nobody in there, I'd be practicing my jump back. And when you're first learning things, it's yeah. a really good idea to practice For sure. outside of the dojo. You have to get used to just if you can just talk from a practical sense, you got to get used to using your your movements on an uneven floor, wearing right. shoes. Right. But just that. Without a gi on. It's so weird. Yeah. It no, is. No snap. No. <laughs> no snap. Mm -hmm. No, I, I train outside a lot in my when I just have a moment if I'm doing yard work or something, or if I just need to clear my mind, just do a couple of kata, whether it's barefoot, just with. I've been wearing barefoot shoes lately, which is nice. Oh, yeah. Uh, so just practicing on something that's not a flat surface or a matted floor is yeah. super beneficial. Very beneficial. And I feel so insignificant when I do that. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're, out, you're so tiny in the middle of... But so it's a good. Certain, there's a certain peacefulness to it. Yeah. Yeah. So... I find that helps, too, Dylan Sunshine. If, you know, sometimes if you just need to calm yourself down, refocus, and just get out of your head sometimes, I just do a sunshine. I did one before I came here today. And it helped get you ready for <laughs> the interview. <laughs> I'll catch you. It did. <laughs> you, spoke, you spoke of, you know, painting in bold strokes and just letting go with your cry. Sometimes if I'm stressed out, I will just do sunshine and just 
burst through it, don't care an ounce for exactly. form or technique or pacing, yeah. you just flow and just, just, just do what feels right and yeah. you can definitely just help calm you down, especially right. with like the internal dynamics of a kata like San Chen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, that's a good point. That's a very good point, Bill. It's, um, it, it's like Buzz always says when you're training, um, to when you practice the technique, but practice it so you know the technique, all the little details of the technique, so that when you don't, when you, if you do need it for self-defense, that it can all fly out the window because you can be bolder and quicker and stronger, but still have your basic technique. Right. If you work on it. You have your foundation. So you get it, yeah, you have to practice the foundation. And under stress, like you're not gonna have perfect technique. Right. So you've been doing this, you've been training in the martial arts for a long time. You've seen all sorts of different phases of evolution of the martial arts in the United States. Is there anything that like, you would like to see progress more? Anything you'd like to see change in how people train or approach the martial arts? Um, I, I like, I, I'm not sure what happens in a lot of other schools, but I, in Fair. most of the Weiji schools there, we have our basic curriculum. It's very limited with mm -hmm. only eight kata and a few exercises and bankais and stuff. Um, no, in the individual schools, I really can't think of anything, but I would really love to see the evolution of the martial arts in schools, okay. like community schools, grammar school, uh, middle school, high school, because it, it's just so good for everybody. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, and a lot of place, schools now don't even have, well, we used to call it gym. I don't know if what they do, but it's so good for everybody. I mean, I see students come in here, young and old, and not have confidence, not be able to like look somebody in the eye when they're speaking with them. And then I'll see the same students a few months later, and they're just full of, not full of confidence, but they feel so much better about themselves. And if all that could be taught in the schools, that's where I would like to see karate evolving. That'd I think what we do really in the individual cool. schools is good. Mm -hmm. You know, styles are different, teachers are different, but um, yeah, that's... If everyone trained martial arts and everyone it, it, trained martial arts with the proper mindset, not just the yeah. physical aspect of it, but right. the mental aspect of it, there'd be a lot more respect, hopefully, between yeah. everyone. Yeah, more compassion, more kindness, more respect. Empathy. Empathy. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. I know, I know it. So, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> Otherwise, I think the only thing I would add to a workout or a class is um, just make it a little more total, like maybe some little bit of nutrition advice at the mm. end or um, a different set of exercises. Yeah. But things have evolved because with the way we used to do sit-ups years ago, you know, sometimes they're not good for your back and right. and there are more efficient ways of working out. So I think all that um, helps to bring in things like that into a class. I think so too. And even if you're not a nutrition expert or if you're not a right. fitness expert, having someone come. And you've got to be careful here, with that too. You can because like, uh, I'm not... It, given advice right. it's not to give advice but just like some kind you know there are some basic healthy things to do for your body and to it's it's funny you, you mentioned that i i saw many years ago a clip of someone saying something that i thought was very profound is he was talking about self-defense and mm -hmm. i know here in the dojo we talk a lot about chances are you're you're not going to be attacked on the street and use your cry, but if you do, you have it. But the stuff we learn here is that self-discipline, that focus, mm. that confidence that you were mentioning. But this one gentleman was saying one of the biggest things you can do for your own personal self-defense is working out, being healthy, and eating right. Because mm -hmm. that's still yourself. You're still protecting yourself by being healthy. Right. And just right, that's right. that nutritional aspect of life is quite important. It's huge. It's yeah. huge. 
So you kind of you kind of touched upon a, a lot of this already, but I just want to ask the question: like, what do you define as your way of karate? We all have our own philosophies, our own methodologies mm -hmm. of training, or mental aspects of training. But what would you describe as like you, Judy Durkin? What what do you describe as your your budo, your way of of karate? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> Um, I, I think like karate do, karate j means to me it's, um, it's, well, part of your life. And all, the, all these are like people have said for years. But it's the way that you live your life. And I think everything we learn in the dojo, and the, the big word for me is integrity. Mm. So you can't, and it's very hard to leave the dojo, work out with like-minded people, um, happy people, positive people, people helping each other, and then go out and be mean to someone at the supermarket. So to me, karate in my life means just having um, kindness, compassion. Oh, that, that woman needs a smile. You know, someone in line at the supermarket. Um, and just being kind, peaceful, I never get too upset over anything. It, it, I mean, <laughs> what's the sense? You upset would scare me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's like, you know, someone pushes your car to something or whatever if you're in a store and it's like, okay. Or someone of a lower rank, and this upsets some people, will say, oh no, do it this way. The, okay, whatever, you know, you, I just, try to stay even, and it, I don't even have to work at it anymore. It's just part of who I am. And I, and I get all that from karate, from the martial arts. I just try to take out what I do in here and bring it out there. Was there ever a time in your life where that was more challenging? Or do you think that's kind of who you are at your core as a person? Like, did you have to work on that aspect of it, that peaceful aspect of it? to get to where you are today? Um, I think it's probably part of who I always was, but um, I, it was, I, tend, I always tended to be a worrier as well about things that never happened. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know how I that- I get that. Yeah, and um, so, I, so I think that now with the whole meditative part of the martial arts and just being more peaceful and and not worrying about what's never going to happen. And if it does happen, there's nothing, you know, you I don't can, know if I can explain no, it. No, no, right, I, I get it. You can, you can be prepared, but you don't have to live your life in fear or stress over something, whether that's a physical thing or a mental thing. Right. What's this person going to say? We, I mean, I'm definitely a person who, who does worry about stuff like that. Like, Yeah, I used to. Can, you can live your life like, okay, if it happens, I have these skills to... Deal yeah. with that situation, whether that's a interpersonal skill or the physical ability to deal with the situation. I think mm -hmm. that's something that. And is I think a, a big thing too along that same line is not taking anything personally. So that's huge, and it it just frees you up from everything. Mm -hmm. Anything that happens in the dojo, or anything anyone says, or outside the dojo, and it's anything so online. now. Now my big thing now is. It's none of my business what people think of me. <laughs> That's a, it's, and it's true, and I don't care. I don't care. It's, it's important. <laughs> it's okay. Can I tell you something embarrassing? <laughs> so I, I try to have that same attitude in life where people can feel the way they feel. Sometimes if it's something I care about, it might upset me more than if it's something I don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially online, like everything's so anonymous online. Someone says something, like I just brush it off. Yeah, yeah, same. Like whatever. But I was trying to sell something on Facebook Marketplace, and <laughs> I basically got told a vulgar word by a bot, and it, <gasps> the audacity of it set me off. I was like, "This is ridiculous! Why would you say that to someone?" But my wife's like, "It's a bot." I'm like, I know it's a bot, but imagine if this is a person <laughs> saying this. Like, I'm like, I know this is not a real person, <laughs> but I'm upset by this. Like, I'm better than this. If this was someone saying this in my face, I'd be like, "Okay, cool." Oh my but a goodness, yeah, me. isn't it crazy? Maybe it was just the audacity, like, why would you say that to someone over something like, so it was like, they wanted my phone number, like, I'm not going to give you my phone number, we can talk to messengers. <laughs> and even if it was, maybe it was the audacity of someone like, who was making the spot say, if they say this, you say this, and like, 
Ah. So I was not my Judy Durkin Zen space <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> well, it, I mean, I'll just say something quickly as well. We got having some work done at the house and we got three quotes and um, finally decided on one. The guy who gave us the third quote texted me and he said, um, you know, have you made up, made a decision or whatever? And I wrote back and we had a good relationship texting before this and he came out, you know, to look it over and give us the quote. And, I wrote back, I said, yeah, you know, I'm sorry, but we decided to go with blah, 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 mm -hmm. and my God, he wrote back like the ter most terrible. I was horrified. Well, you should have let me know, and, but how does he know that I didn't just find out who I went with? Yeah. But it was so rude, and um, I, I read it to Buzz, and he goes, just ignore it. And I am good at ignoring things, but... It was, it was so rude. Yeah. And, you know, I took my time. I went out there, and you didn't have the decency to get back to me and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and had not even that much time that, had gone by. Yeah, just one of those little things that we can learn to brush off in the daily life because yeah. it's not a big deal. Right. This guy being rude to you, you can just never talk to him again and block, and I can block the bot that's swearing <laughs> at me. <laughs> the bot. <laughs> AI struck again. <laughs> uh, so you have a you have a big promotion coming up. Do you want to talk about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Always a humble is person. Is that public? Judy. It is. It is now. <laughs> Always a humble person, Judy. You're, you're definitely you're definitely doing this a long time. You've been teaching and training in Wei Chiru for since 1971 over 50 years I mean 10th mm. degree black belt's a, it's a big deal it's as much huge. as I know you don't care you are one of the few people I can say like this person definitely doesn't care about rank because I feel like you just want to hit people <laughs> but it, I mean it it's is, it is huge a big deal. and yeah. if I let myself think about it then I get all nervous and mm -hmm. worked up so I don't think about it I'm I just do what I do and I, I'm doing it harder in training so I'm in training now mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm just, I know it does seem weird. It is huge, So, but I don't think about it. I just keep doing what I'm doing and training harder, making sure that I'm ready for it. Mm. Is it, does it, I mean, even just being a ninth degree black belt is a, such, a, such a big honor and a big deal. The 10th degree being recognized by by your peers to be at such a level, like, what does that does that what does that mean to you, like emotionally, spiritually, mentally, attitudinally? Do you want me to do more adjectives? <laughs> no. Fearfully. Oh, you've done enough. <laughs> uh, honestly, I I can't say it right now. We'll that talk it in a few means, months. Okay. No, I'm not. Interview part two. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> no, it's not that I won't say it. It's mm. just that I really don't have anything. Right. It's still kind of, you're still kind yeah. of growing into it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm just living my life. I am mm -hmm. training for it. I want to make sure I'm ready, but I don't think about it. I don't think about it daily or even weekly or. I think, I think just the fact that you're taking a seriously training for it uh, shows the the respect and emphasis you have for it. Cause I, I, we've no, we've no, I'm not saying any names, but we know people that get promoted to such a high rank and they don't oh, no, change I, anything. I, so, I mean, you're definitely preparing yeah, to be a representation. Don't of, get me wrong. I do have a lot of respect for no, it. No, no, no. It's think. just to like, you know, keep my mind calm and, when and I, I'm definitely training for it. Yeah. When I've, when I've tested, I've, at least for this last few ranks, like obviously like I care about it and Part of the rank for me is just, it's for my students so that they can progress and continue as well. Because yeah. at this point, like, the rank doesn't, like, affect how I do my training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think just the respect to it and getting ready to, for it is, is a big deal. And yeah. I think that's it's yeah. great that you are representing that way. I think also, as you just said, too, it's a, it is a big deal. And it's... Um, I think it shows my respect for the school and and everything and the system and that people think I'm ready for it. Mm -hmm. 
and so I'll do it. <laughs> so I think, I think we'll kind of start wrapping up. Is there any other thoughts that you want to, to add or any philosophies that you want to share? Um, I, I think people, uh, some, I, I, sometimes people place limits on themselves. And all I'll say is there are no limits. Don't put any limits on yourself for your workout. And um, I mentioned this earlier to somebody, but one of my favorite quotes or sayings is, garden and like you'll live forever. Garden like you'll live forever. And that means to me, you know, if you're 96 years old and you plant a fruit tree that takes 10 years to fruit, plant it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and somehow I'm, th I'm applying that to karate. And so work out like you'll live forever. There are no limits to your workout. Work out like you live forever and do what you want to do and just embrace yourself and embrace your karate and your workouts. Well, with that being said, let's go hit each other. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Thanks, we appreciate Bill. it. Thank you.